Hello, welcome to Harborside History for April. I'm Karen Bloom, Manager of Education and Programming for Historic Charleston Foundation. And this month, it's our birthday. Happy birthday to us. So, Charter Day for Historic Charleston Foundation falls on April 28th. And so this month, we're gonna explore, well, our own history right here by the harbor side. Let's go check it out. As you surely know by now, Historic Charleston Foundation is celebrating 75 years. We started our preservation initiatives in 1947, and Historic Charleston Foundation has really been a trailblazing organization in all sorts of different initiatives. It means that we've had the opportunity to make incredible city partnerships and really be an, an example, not just for the city here, but nationwide in preservation efforts. Of course, we're all incredibly proud to work for an organization with such an outstanding preservation legacy. So, as I mentioned, Historic Charleston Foundation has been in operation since 1947. In fact, we were chartered and incorporated on April 28th of that year. And another way that we're a trailblazing organization, our first director was a woman, Frances Edmonds. And not only that, but many of the generous donors and preservationists over the years who have supported Historic Charleston Foundation have been women as well including a really important early donor, Sally Reard. In fact, this room is named for her. This is the Sally Reard Reading Room here in the 18th century Miss Rune House. We're pretty fortunate. We get to work in an 18th century building as our active office building. This building was preserved, a protective cocoon was built around it, and now we've got state-of-the-art offices and archives to work from to do our preservation work. In fact, archives is right down the hall. Do you wanna go see? Let's check it out. Archives is open for general usage and research. If you have a question, you can always contact our archivist and come and do some research of your own. Let's go. Now, Historic Charleston Foundation has always been an architectural preservation organization, but we're so much more than that. Here in the archives, the records that are kept support all three pillars of the mission of the Historic Charleston Foundation, and they're made up of preservation, education, and advocacy. These archives help support all the different departments of the foundation, as well as independent researchers who come from near and far to learn more about the history of Charleston. Historic Charleston Foundation may be best known as a preservation organization, and after our 1947 charter, the foundation wasted no time in setting up a very special event to generate revenue for the nonprofit's mission. It was originally called the Festival of Houses, but today you know it as the Festival of Houses and Gardens, one of the longest running heritage tour programs in America. Our 75th anniversary year festival just finished up. A few decades after Charter, Historic Charleston Foundation played a key role in the 1974 Historic Preservation Plan that was adopted by the city of Charleston. This plan involved a complex inventory and evaluation of over 2,000 structures in the city, and it resulted in a height ordinance that protects the integrity of the historic streetscapes. The plan was even revised in the early 2000s to include examinations of social, economic, and cultural issues affecting the preservation of the city. The National Trust for Historic Preservation even gave us an award for that work. As you'll see, preservation, education, and advocacy are all intertwined in Historic Charleston Foundation's mission. Another early initiative by the Historic Charleston Foundation was the purchase of the Nathaniel Russell House in 1955, 
with the intent to fulfill the educational pillar of our mission. It's been open as a museum for visitors since 1956, showcasing architecture, decorative arts, and the narratives of the lives of all who lived on the property, both free and enslaved. With the addition of the Aiken Rett House in 1995, we have the wonderful opportunity to invite learners of all ages to a variety of tours, field trips, and educational programming at all of our historic locations. We're even welcoming you from afar with this new Harborside History digital initiative. Yeah, education pillar, here we are. Both house museums have also provided opportunities for the architectural preservation that Historic Charleston Foundation specializes in to be showcased and on display. And not just that, education isn't just place-based. The house museums and here at headquarters are great venues for learning from tours to lectures, but there's more to do in the community. We also have the Tangled Roots Initiative, which is an exploration of Johns Island history civil rights movement, and Esau Jenkins' legacy on the island, involving the school children at Hot Gap Middle in civic education and duty to their community, their friends, and their family. Education is a big part of what we do here at Historic Charleston Foundation, and I'm proud to be part of this team. And finally, the pillar of advocacy. As preservation evolves, it's moving from its traditional role of simply saving historic buildings into a much more complex set of issues, addressing broader quality of life questions like affordable housing, mobility and transportation needs, and tourism management throughout the city. Our advocacy team regularly attends Board of Architectural Review meetings, Planning Commission meetings, and Board of Zoning Appeals meetings. Anything that concerns the foundation in terms of threatening the character of our special community. And really, we've been doing this for a while. Back in 1957, Historic Charleston Foundation established the nation's first revolving fund to rehabilitate the Ansonboro neighborhood. A revolving fund works like this. By buying a property, stabilizing it, and then selling it to a preservation-minded buyer, Historic Charleston Foundation is able to then reinvest the proceeds from the sale of that house to purchase another house in the neighborhood and to do the same process all over again. Historic Charleston Foundation established a pioneering urban renewal and preservation initiative that continues to serve as a national model, preserving not just architecture, but those neighborhoods that are so important. It's only when we advocate for all of our neighborhoods, our historic buildings, our parks, gardens, and most especially the memories that they're made of, and it's only when we share those stories that we can understand who we truly are. And that's how we're able to make the vital decisions that move us all forward together as a community. You can find all of this information on the three pillars of our mission on our website. So make sure you go and check out historiccharleston.org. How do you like our visit to the archives? <laughs> if it was too short, don't worry. We've got a lot more to see there, and we will in upcoming episodes. But before we leave the office, there's one more place that we have to check in with Winslow Hasty, our president and CEO. Hey, Winslow. Hey. Hey, do you have a few minutes to talk with us? I do. All right. So, of course, for this Harborside history, we're talking about the history of the historic Charleston Foundation. And I was wondering if, as president and CEO, you could tell us a little bit about what the foundation's impact has been for the past 75 years. Absolutely. That's a, a fun topic to talk about because we've, you know, we've been involved. This organization has been involved in so many things uh, in Charleston, in the entire region. We're very well known in the, nationally in the preservation field as being a leader in a lot of areas. Um, probably most famously, we're very well known for starting the first revolving fund program in the country. That, of course, started in Ansonboro, and we've talked a lot about the impacts that had in, in turning that neighborhood around and having, uh, you know, expanding our worldview of preservation beyond just individual buildings and 
expanding it out to a neighborhood and then brought more broadly into a, an entire community. So the revolving fund was huge because it's it established that model that's now been copied all over the country uh, by other organizations. Um, of course, our easements program, we can't talk about the foundation without highlighting our easements program. We have over 400 easements on properties all over uh, downtown Charleston, as well as uh, very significant plantation properties outside of town. So our reach is actually a lot broader than a lot of people realize. We have project properties that we protect down in the Ace Basin all the way up to Georgetown. So one more really important point that I'd love for you to talk about is it's been 75 years since the Stark Charleston Foundation was chartered, but we've got a future. Can you give us an idea of where we go from here in 2022? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really exciting time for preservation because the movement has really sort of um, embedded itself in all aspects of city making and, um, and really policy, public policy. Uh, Charleston is, is now well known because of our hard work over many decades um, yes. as a preservation minded community. And we want to make sure that that continues. And, and the idea of sort of community has really expanded. I mean, we get involved in all kinds of city uh, planning efforts, whether it be the rewrite of a comprehensive plan or um, trying to improve our design review process with our Board of Architectural Review or even addressing flooding and sea level rise through the Dutch Dialogues project that we did. So um, we've sort of, we're weaving preservation into really every aspect of how the city um, governs growth and infrastructure and, and the preservation of community. Um, what's also really exciting is the idea of preservation has really grown. It's really not just about old buildings that were built in the 19th century. It's about communities, it's about people, and it's about culture. So. This idea that preservation, we're not just trying to preserve bricks and mortar and, and old pieces of wood, which are very important, um, but we're really trying to preserve these communities and, and, and to shed light on maybe some underrepresented um, resources in our community, like the settlement communities that we're working on in Outer Mount Pleasant and on James Island and Mosquito Beach and Saul Labrie. Um, there's a growing appreciation for these uh, African-American uh, free, freedmen communities that were established in, right after the war during emancipation. And that growing awareness then leads to further protections. And so we're working very hard to um, expand that. And these communities are really getting galvanized around these issues and, and um, sort of taking their future into their own hands. I think it's safe to say that as we've been saying all year, even though it's been 75 years, we're just getting started. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, let's go check out a little bit uh, down on the street. Isn't it incredible? The amount of work that Historic Charleston Foundation has done through preservation, education, and advocacy in this city. Make sure when you visit this year that you take a look around for those red flags with the 75th anniversary on them. They're a visual representation of just a fraction of the impact that Historic Charleston Foundation's trailblazing initiatives have had throughout the city. With a mission to preserve and protect and champion not just the historic structures of this city, but our communities as well, it's really important that we pursue all of our initiatives into the future. 75 years, 175 years, 275 more years. And we're gonna do just that here on Harborside History. We'll see you next month. May is preservation month. So we're gonna dive into that pillar and see what we can learn a little bit deeper. Until then, make sure that you stop and look around. History is happening every day.